today we're going to be in the Gospel of Luke, the 11th chapter. Our focus will be verses 14 to 26. What we're seeing is an increasing rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Pharisees are going to, as uh, Jesus would talk about in other Gospels, in Matthew and in Mark, and we see here in the Gospel of Luke, the, the Pharisees are doing something very dangerous, and the Lord Jesus warns them about it. They are attributing the power of Almighty God to Satan. And Jesus would talk to them about committing the unforgivable sin, the idea of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Saying instead of this being done by the power of the Holy Spirit, attributing that to Satan himself. So in the Gospel of Luke, the 11th chapter, and begins verse 14, we're going to see how Jesus is accused of demonic power. And in verse 14, Jesus cast out a demon. The Bible says, and Jesus was casting out a demon, and it was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds were amazed. Now the Pharisees have a problem, because they cannot deny that a great work has just happened, can they? Here's this mute man that is now speaking. They cannot deny of the miracle and the, the power of the Lord the fact that he was able to cast out this demon and this man is now speaking. But then, verse 15, the Jesus' opponents claimed demonic power. So they're like, we can't say they, he, by power that he's cast out this demon. But now they're going to try to switch this all around. In verse 15 say, but some of them said he cast out demons by Beelzebul. Some translations say Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. So they said, oh, he's doing this by Beelzebul, the, the ruler of the demons. It's a name, it's a title that is given for Satan. He's doing this in the power of Satan. Can you see how serious this is to attribute the work of Almighty God in saying this is, he's working through the power of Satan, the ruler of the demons? Pastor Paul Chapel writes about this. They knew that Jesus was powerful, but were not convinced that he was good. Satan is a powerful creature that has authority over demons, beings who use their power to appear like gods. That Jesus was serving Satan could be the only conclusion if the religious leaders and others rejected him as Messiah. They had to somehow explain his obvious and public displays of miraculous power. So they're trying to explain his power by attributing this work by Beelzebul or by Satan himself. And they go farther. The, uh, his opponents now are going to demand a sign from heaven. In verse 16, others to test him were demanding of him a sign from heaven. Now, what did we just see? Jesus has cast out the demons of a mute man, and this man is now speaking. But they're saying, show us a sign from heaven that we may believe in you. Guess what? Even if there was a sign that comes from heaven, they still would be in unbelief. How do we know that? Well, in the Gospel of John, 
there were 5,000 men, and Jesus feeds these 5,000 men, probably 20 to 25,000 people total in the crowd with women and children. And Jesus used a boy's lunch, five round barley loaves, and two small fish. In the Greek, the diminutive is used, which means it's two little fish used for bait. And he kept distributing that to the disciples, and they kept giving it out to the thousands. And those that were there, those that had their stomachs filled, those that ate of the fish and the barley loaves, some of that crowd would say, show us a sign that we may believe you. Some that were there as part of that feeding of the 5,000 men said, show us a sign. So even though they're saying, oh, show us a sign from heaven and we'll believe. No, they wouldn't. But Jesus is going to answer his opponents. In verse 17, I love this first phrase, but Jesus knew their thoughts. They didn't even have to speak it. He knew exactly what they were thinking. He knew their thoughts. And said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a house divided against itself falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul. And if I by Beelzebul cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast out the demons? So they will be your judges. By what power are your sons casting out? And he says, they'll, they'll judge whose power this is. His answer. He said their thoughts were totally illogical. So Satan would be, by Satan's power, casting out demons? Wouldn't that be dividing the kingdom? How's that house, how's that kingdom going to stand if it's dividing? You see, what's the issue is they're unbelieving. They're, they will not place their trust. They will not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They will not believe in him. But they, they have to have an explanation about what's happening. So they went completely illogical to say he's doing this by the power of Satan. They're desperate, aren't they? Verse 20, Jesus' kingdom had come. Jesus says, but if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Here in the Gospel of Luke, we see Jesus uses the finger of God as an equivalent to what we see in the Gospel of Matthew to the Spirit of God. By doing this according to God's power, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Dr. Tony Evans wrote, if Jesus cast out demons by the power of God, then he must be the Messiah bringing his kingdom. I want to show you a couple of glorious verses in Colossians chapter 1. I love these verses. It tells us what takes place when somebody places their trust in Jesus Christ, when somebody is saved. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, the Apostle Paul writes, 
For he, referencing to Almighty God, rescued us from the domain of darkness. Whose domain is that? Satan's. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. The glorious news of the transformation when somebody believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, when somebody is saved, the word saved, delivered, that's what happens. He rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, Jesus Christ. A glorious news of the power of God and what he does. But the whole issue here with the Pharisees is unbelief. And it led them to blasphemy. And as we continue the words of Jesus in verse 21, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are undisturbed. But when someone stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away from him all his armor on which he had relied and distrib uh, distributes his plunder. When we think about the very reality, here's the truth. Jesus is stronger than Satan. You have Satan, the strong man, but when someone stronger comes in, the someone stronger is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When we think about the spiritual battle, when we think about what takes place at the cross and with the resurrection of Jesus, we have a pronouncement of victory over the demonic forces over Satan himself. They thought there was victory when Jesus was dead and now he's buried. But all the victory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, at the cross. The victory. Warren Wiersbe put it this way, Jesus pictured Satan as a strong man in armor guarding his palace and his goods, but Jesus invaded Satan's territory, destroyed his armor and weapons, and claimed his spoils. There's a couple references here that we will see exactly how this is put in the scriptures. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15. The Bible says, when Jesus had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphant over them through him, through Christ. Christ at the cross. The power of God. And then we see in the book of Hebrews chapter 2. Do you know what Satan's strongest ally is? Death. Death. But here's glorious news. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, Jesus himself likewise also partook of the same that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. May free those, the fear of death and in slavery all their lives, because Jesus Christ conquered the grave. You know, when we stand at the graveside 
of a, a one that loved the Lord Jesus Christ. We can read those words of 1 Corinthians 15 and know the confidence. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? For death has been swallowed up in victory. Why? Because Jesus Christ conquered the grave. And as Jesus Christ conquered the grave, we see in the book of Hebrews chapter 2, he defeated the power of the devil because we no longer have to fear. Because the believer who dies has went into the very presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So therefore, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? It's been swallowed up. Amen? Friend, here's the reality. We're not fighting for victory. The victory's been won. Jesus judged Satan at the cross. He's an active foe, isn't he? But he's a defeated foe. Satan has been a defeated foe. He's awaiting the final damnation. Well, we see in the book of Revelation, Satan is going to be chained up for a thousand years. But the bad news is, after those thousand years are done, he's got to be let loose for a while. But then, he's going to be cast forever and ever into the lake of fire. Jesus is stronger than Satan. Satan is permitted limited authority, but he is a defeated enemy. So the great news as we're told in this spiritual battle that we're in, Ephesians 6, 10 to 20 tells us, our focus really needs to be on the Lord. Keep your focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he talks about putting on the spiritual armor. All of those are based upon spiritual truth. In fact, the belt of truth or the, the girdle of truth, God's word, the helmet of salvation. Did Satan ever try to tell you that you're not really saved, that you're, that you're really not a Christian? Maybe something has, maybe there's the guilt and, and various things that come up. And, and so the accuser of the brethren says, oh, if you were a Christian, you would never have said that. You would have never done that. But here's great news. 1 John 2, 1 says, John writes, these things are written that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, he has an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The great news, if you sin as a believer, now the desire is, these are written that you might not sin. But if we do sin against the Lord, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, because of his great love, because of the cleansing and forgiveness that's available to the believer. In my college years, I went through a series of, a season of doubt. Oh, it was terrible. Those feelings of, am I really saved? But you know what? The Holy Spirit used the scriptures. And when I started studying John 10, when I started studying Philippians 1, 6, that says, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it till the day of Christ Jesus, and then when I started reading in Romans chapter 8, that nothing shall separate me from the love of Christ. In John 10, that nothing shall snatch you out of my hand. Nothing. You know what? I started thanking the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the scriptures. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the assurance that I have. 
Thank you for 1 John 5, 13 that says that these things are written that you may know you have eternal life. I can stand before you and say, I thank the Lord I have not a hope so salvation, I have a no so salvation. Because of God's word. A good friend of mine that was a longtime pastor at the first church I pastored in Newark, he used to say, if I have to feel saved, sometimes I'm in trouble. <laughs> but he says, I know that I know because of God's word. That's glorious truth. But here's what Jesus does. He tells the Pharisees now, here's the reality. You have a choice to make. Jesus' critics had a choice. After Jesus had said this to them, he who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. He's saying to these unbelieving Pharisees, you have a choice. If you remain in unbelief, this is what's going on. But if you would believe in me, the truth, you see, they thought they had an established righteousness. We're Abraham's children. We don't need to repent. We don't need forgiveness of sins, was their thinking. They were religious, but lost. They were very religious. But Jesus said their true condition, they were without Christ. Verses 24 through 26, Jesus gives an explanation of neutrality. In a sense, it's reformation without the spiritual transformation going on. And what happens, Jesus says, when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, it passes through waterless places sinking rest and not finding any. It says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it swept and put in order. Then it goes and takes along seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they go in and live there, and the last state of that man becomes worse than the first. What happens is, if you have, in the sense you call it neutrality, or the idea of, you know, here they, they're cast out, but they do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They, the person doesn't come to saving faith. And when that happens, the demon says, well, hey, well, you know what? We'll go back to where we came from and take seven others with him to be a lot worse case than before. Jesus laid it out that there was no idea of being neutral. Oswald Chambers wrote, Neutrality in religion is always cowardice. God turns the cowardice of a desired neutrality into terror. There's people today that try to claim, well, I'm neutral toward Jesus. I'm not really against him, but I'm not really for him. I'm not really believing, and Jesus said, that's impossible. What did Pilate try to do? There's Jesus in Pilate's hall. Pilate says, I don't find any fault in him. Pilate says, I want to release him. But what does the Bible say? Well, there's an old hymn that says, as Jesus standing in Pilate's hall, the question, what will you do with Jesus? Neutral, you cannot be. Do you know that every single person is going to meet Jesus Christ? They either know him as Savior and Lord, and they will be before him at the judgment seat of Christ where he will give rewards to those what they've done in the body. Or those that have said no to Jesus, did not believe in him, 
will stand before Jesus. Revelation 20, verses 11, 15, is called the Great White Throne Judgment, where the books are opened. And there's another book called the Lamb's Book of Life. And the problem is, if they're at the Great White Throne Judgment, their name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. There'll be a lot of people say, well, I, I wasn't really, you know, I, I was just neutral toward Jesus. That's unbelief, friend. That's unbelief. And that unbelief is judged. There's judgment at the great white throne judgment. Almighty God has given us, every single one of us here today, he has given us intellect. There are things that we must know. I must know that I'm a guilty sinner. I must know that my sins went upon Jesus at the cross at Calvary. I must know, yes, that Jesus was dying there for me. He took my place. He took what I deserved. I must know that he rose again just like he said he would. We're told in the scripture different times that we are to know this. Intellect. We have emotion. Guilt is an emotion. Now, emotion alone isn't enough. Intellect enough isn't enough, but emotion. When the Holy Spirit shows me I am guilty and Jesus did this on the cross for me, he took what I deserve. He died there in my place. As the Holy Spirit shows me my guilt before him, convinces me I am guilty of this sin. I have a choice. But Almighty God has made every one of us with a will. And as Jesus was proclaiming and, and talking straight to the Pharisees that tried to say, oh, you're doing this by the power of Beelzebul. Jesus laid it out and he says, you have a choice to make. An act of the will. Friend, the Bible puts it this way in Romans 10, 13. Whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I love it when the Bible uses the word whosoever. Because that whosoever means me. And it means you. You have a choice. Would you bow your heads? Today, as we're going to have a time of invitation, I always appreciated uh, Billy Graham would always call it an hour of decision. In the scriptures, as Jesus would clearly proclaim truth, there was always an opportunity to respond to it. Jesus here is giving the Pharisees a true opportunity to respond to him. And they're accountable for their decision. They're accountable. He gave them an elect, he gave them emotion, and he gave them a will. He has given us an elect, emotion, and will. Salvation takes an act of the will. Somebody must 
call upon the Lord. They must place their trust. They must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not enough to know that I'm a sinner. It's not enough to know that Jesus died on the cross for me. I must personally say, Lord Jesus, you did that for me. I'm a guilty sinner, and you died in my place. And I ask you to come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. If you've never asked Christ in your life, he knows your heart, but I invite you to pray this to him, something like this. Lord Jesus, today I understand that I'm guilty of sin. And you came to this earth and put on flesh and you went to the cross. And even though you are the sinless son of God, you took my sins upon yourself. And you died on that cross for me. You were buried, but you rose again the third day. And right now I believe and I call out to you and I ask you, Lord Jesus, save me from my sins. Forgive me of my sins and be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for hearing my prayer. In your name, Jesus. With the heads bowed, maybe there's somebody here that says, you know, I sincerely, I earnestly ask the Lord just now to come into my life, forgive me of my sins and be my Lord and Savior. I never did that before. But just by, I'm not going to embarrass anybody, but maybe you today say, I prayed that and I asked the Lord. Would you just raise up your hand and put it back down? Oh, Lord, we pray for believers right now. Lord, we pray that we would have a growing love for you. As you examine our hearts and our lives, Lord, there may be a lot of used to's in my life. I used to have that used to be on fire for you as a, a righteous zeal, a passion for you. And that passion has cooled. As your word says, maybe it's lukewarm. But Lord, you said, if I find myself in that lukewarm condition, you said to repent. There's a change of mind that leads to a change of direction. Oh, Lord, if there's a believer here today that says, you know, I may come to church, I may read my Bible, I may even pray, but I'm not on fire for the Lord like I once was. That zeal is not there, that passion. I've become lukewarm. Oh, Lord, that even today they would confess the sin of lukewarmness to you. And thank you that you said that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That we would not be disobedient to you, but we would obey you in this, in this invitation. Have your way, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you please stand?